Hello there, welcome to Fireside with Peter Atkinson on Gen Con TV. Uh, my host, my co-host today, Beverly Marshall Sailing, myself, I'm Peter Atkinson, and our guest today is Scaff Elias. Also joining us today is our producer, Kristen Jensen, who will be the disembodied voice uh, talking uh, from over at our control station. Uh, on Fireside, we go in search of the untold stories behind your favorite games. And uh, specifically this season, we're focused on Magic the Gathering and uh, the early years, the creation of Magic the Gathering. How did it get started? Who were the people who were involved in actually making the game and getting it published? And those early sort of formation of Magic as a, as a product line. And there really are very few people as qualified to talk about those years as our guest today. Uh, he was one of the original, the famous East Coast playtesters who were back at the University of Pennsylvania with Richard Garfield, helping to develop and playtest Magic the Gathering, and then later was hired to join Wizards of the Coast full time as a designer and developer of all sorts of games, Magic included. So. Welcome to our show, Scaff Elias. Hello. Did I leave anything out? Is that? No, that's great. That, that's pretty good? Sure. Good enough. I really appreciate you coming on. It's <laughs> great to be here. It's, mm -hmm. I, I, well, I think most people know, if they know me, know that I'm uh, a big fan of yours. Oh, well, I'm a big fan of yours. So. It's, a, it's <laughs> great to just have a chance to sit down and talk. It takes something like this to get us together sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. We're both busy. We're both busy. Yeah. So. All right, let's go back in time to 1991, 1990, 1991. 91. Uh, we yeah. like to start with, you know, Richard, you know, his big epiphany moment was in the summer of 1991. Uh, but you already knew Richard. You were with him in some way. Tell us about where, how you knew Richard before well, I first, this happened. I first met him in the summer of 1991. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, uh, I had just entered grad school at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, I was physics originally. I switched to math during the course of it, but uh, I didn't. Ha there wasn't an office for me in the physics department, so they, you know, there was some overfill. So some of the physics students were up in the math department. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, all my the people I was around were math people, and uh, and then Richard, of course, was in the. He was in a PhD, school in PhD program there. for mathematics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he would just come around and have people play games. So we fell right. into a group, a bunch of physics and math students and astrophysics students, a couple computer science guys, fell into this uh, group and we just we played games. All You're playing time. it. So you, before he designed Magic, you knew him, but not for that long. And not for that long. Not for that long. And right. so, so you met him, um, I imagine, instantly liked him. I mean... We sure. all do, right? Yeah. I mean, Richard. Yeah, who doesn't? Yeah. Who does it? Right. Maybe thought he was a little weird. <laughs> yeah, well, but still like do. Like we would know weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like we would know weird. But uh, <laughs> but no, no, it was great. It was just a lot of fun. Right. So, so he comes out to the West Coast. He comes out to Portland. That's when I end up meeting him, and um, uh, he pitched Robo Rally to me as Wizard of the Coast. We had not actually published anything yet. We were a really small game company. We had started to make role-playing games, but mm -hmm. in the back of my mind, I was kind of thinking maybe role-playing, maybe we need to do more than that. Mm -hmm. So I met with Richard and Mike Davis to um, about Robo Rally, and in the course of that conversation, uh, he came out of that. The next couple of days was inspired and came up with the idea of a collectible card game, not really the design yet. Right. So then he goes back to the University of Pennsylvania and meets up with you guys. Did he just like immediately bust through the door and say, guys, I have this great idea? Did no, he, no, no, Did no, he kind no. of stay <clears throat> in a, working on it on his own for a little while? Or? How, how, how refined was it when he first introduced it to you? Uh, well, I guess I would have been the third person to play it. Yeah. Uh, the first person was uh, Barry Reich, who, okay. who was there, and so I played it almost immediately after they did. And what it was was uh, it was you know basically one deck or split into two uh, two decks and um, little tiny cardboard cards. And right. uh, anyone that played that would immediately recognize it as Magic. So when you say, are those like the, I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, the world of Magic, at least the hardcore world of Magic, has seen those playtest cards, because uh -huh. they're a collector's item, they get auctioned off. They probably on, haven't seen that deck. Uh, yeah. It actually looked very similar to the other decks, but in terms of the, you know, the, the material it was on, the whatever, right. the, the cardboardy stuff, and um, I think those, were, that was probably yellow backs, yellow or green, I don't know. Uh, so most of the 
decks that people have seen since then were the beta or gamma tests, not the alpha deck. Right. So, so he has these cards, but they have things, the concepts like land and spells and oh, yeah, yeah. No, tapping. I mean, you, would, and you would play that game and you would say, this is magic. There were, everything was basically like it is now. So, I mean, there, there were a couple of things with the instance, the interrupts were different, and those, you know, formed a little bit later, but, you know, it, it was 90%. Really, really close. Yeah. So, I mean, what did you guys do for the next two years? Play, like, play, play it. Play it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we did. You did. We played and we traded. Um, mm -hmm. And adding more cards, uh, the rules weren't written down. There was right. some flabbiness. A lot of the stuff wasn't, you know, the wording. And, you know, I mean, there were still stuff to do, but, right. the you know, the basic... Yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, I think that that's really amazing. For some reason, when I when, you know, when I talk about magic, sometimes, and I describe getting to play test cards when mm -hmm. he first sent a bunch of them to the office, mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things I always mention is like, if I showed you these cards, you could play with these cards. All I would have yeah. to do is say that B means blue instead of a blue mana symbol, et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And it's right. Well, actually, I don't know. Yeah. It, or it wasn't a B. You. Black. U was blue and B was black. But, yes. No, that, that came right. much later, actually. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That, that was much later. No, they were, you know, colored in with, you know, oh. the little circles were colored in. Oh, oh my so, God. The first one. The, the very right. first one. Now, yeah. the one you got might have already yeah. had the... We didn't have colored versions. Did you didn't have, have the circles? We didn't uh, have the he circles. probably at some point realized it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Every circle was going to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a lot of work. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. But other than that, then the, it would have been the same. What was your first impression? I mean, did you immediately know, oh my God, this has amazing potential? Or, like, eh, never, you know, I mean. Hey, that's kind of fun. Yeah. That was Jim Lynn's response. It, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was fun and it was a good game, but, y you know, when you say did it have potential, we didn't know what potential meant. <laughs> so you can't really right. understand because you, you had no idea how big the gaming market was. We had no idea mm -hmm. about any sort of money thing. The gaming market, of course, wasn't even that big back then. So, right. no, there's no way to think. Even, even if you said, oh, we're going to sell these to every person in America, you wouldn't have, still wouldn't have understood the how, know, how, the, how big? Pretend, how big? But you were a gamer, yeah, right. So, re putting aside the question of how big it would be on the market, were you immediately excited along the lines of like, I really hope this game gets published because the world deserves to see this. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't really <laughs> care about the world. Scaff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I didn't really. Uh, you, no, you still don't, right? I, it seemed, <laughs> that's pretty true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a great game, and uh, and so uh, people people don't even actually understand today what the hobby market was like. It's changed so much. It right. used to be a super super mm -hmm. super niche thing, and you know there was just no yeah. You just because you liked it, you were able to find these things, whether it's you know the whatever the Napoleonic miniatures mm -hmm. or. You know, Dungeons and Dragons. Was, Dungeons and Dragons was a little bit different because that right. was more mass market. But all the, any role playing game below Dungeons and Dragons, like mm -hmm. you had to go somewhere to get it. Mm -hmm. You right. didn't just get right. it. And you had to, you know, put up a three by five in the game store to find somebody to play it with. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so it was just a different world. So no, we never really thought like I didn't think everyone should be forced to play it. And I, you know, for the longest time, it, it was essentially right. It was a card game made by math graduate student <laughs> for <laughs> math and physics graduate students and hardcore gamers who were willing to drive across the country to wait in lines to play Dungeons and Dragons, right? Because that was your initial right. right and right. and mm -hmm. so you don't you don't really think about it as being, you know, for people. <laughs> Okay, okay, we're gonna we're we're gonna try a different line of attack here yeah. on this. So, so okay, so during this period of uh, this basically two year period, although not all of it, University of Pennsylvania, not you know blah blah blah, but um, so this period of time when you and a bunch of other guys like Jim Lynn, Chris Page, and so on, uh, Bill Rose, Joel Mick, Dave Petty, Dave Petty. Mm -hmm who were um, uh, all involved in playing this in the East Coast playtesters. Um, uh, what, what do you remember in terms of like some interesting moments in that time or interesting discussions or debates that came up um, about like how this game should be structured? Yeah, like, well, well uh, you know, it was, we, we played it for about two years before it came out. Right. Mm -hmm. So we had a long time where 
we were limited by the, the physical nature of it. So, right. um, so the, the, whatever was going to happen in the marketplace was not really um, something we were even able to test. So we did, you know, by printing a bunch of cards and then accumulating them, we eventually got some decks that were really quite good decks. Uh -huh. And so the things that eventually became the Power 9, uh, we, we knew that those were, you know, in any sort of reasonable amounts, they're just completely broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then the Power 9 cards, of course, like the Moxes, the yeah. Black Lotus, Time Walk, mm -hmm. yeah. et cetera. Uh, the, those types, recall. The, the, the first yeah. sorts of things. The yeah. first cards that were banned from tournament play. Right, and, yeah. and so those were all the ones that we, you know, immediately knew were just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you could get a bunch of them. Right. right? But if you only had one, because uh, what we would be playing, I guess, would be the equivalent today almost of sealed deck. That's how it started mm -hmm. with right. a little bit of trading. And then if you have, oh, 10, 20 sealed decks and you, you know, you mm -hmm. play those together, you can get, you know, pretty good stuff, kind of, just barely. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but a lot of those were uncommon and some were common and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, we, we would solve the problem by just pushing them to rare because a single mox really isn't as good at, a, you know, in a sealed deck as a Sarah Angel or a, Oh yeah, right. I mean, a know, mox is like this amazing or, or card, but if, back if you then. were doing a sealed deck or a draft, you might not even draft right. a, a mox, right? right. Well, right. probably would. But you might, it depends on what other card is there <laughs> right. and what the set is. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think in the in the environment at the time, at least, you know, Fireball is a much more valuable card. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So, uh, it, so anyway, uh, we thought the problem was solved because we just couldn't imagine anyone buying, you know, multiple copies. Uh, right. Like, you know, right. maybe, oh, maybe two decks. So, you know, we did these estimates of like, well, let's say your average play group is, and this goes back to the old days of yeah. gaming, you know, uh, maybe five people, maybe 10. Okay, we'll double it. Let's say your play group's 20 people. Mm -hmm. Right. And then every person will buy one deck. Well, maybe they'll buy two. Someone might buy three. <laughs> oh, let's just, let's just say everyone buys you three, know, three decks. decks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and then you do this estimate of what the total play group is, and it's 60 decks. And it's like, okay, well, you know, you're going to get a, a, on average, a, one mox in the, of all the in the whole right. set, and mm -hmm. so it's right. not a big deal, right. uh, and it'll be great, and people have fun and they'll play. Right. And right. then there there is an email which I, I've looked for, <laughs> and I cannot find. I think there I know where this is going. There is an email which says, "Well, either our estimates right, and this stuff won't be broken, or we're all going to be rich." <laughs> <laughs> win win, really. Win win, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So that that was the you know in the early days, and then it it was really. Um, it was quite interesting there because you know it was sort of like dueling or almost mm -hmm. right you you would see someone in the hallway and you would offer to play them and then they would like lower their eyes and <laughs> shuffle around and say they had something to do <laughs> because, you know. because they knew you'd, you'd, they're going to get deck. beaten they're going to yeah. get beaten well you guys were playing for Andy then yeah it was yeah. all for Andy yeah, yeah. all so, for Andy yeah so then what what started that also kind of makes the whole mox thing different it, because if you think you might right. lose it you may not and if you've started playing magic the gathering since 1995 you might not know that original magic ante was both players would shuffle their decks and then you draw the top card off each deck put them aside that was the ante whoever won the match got to keep both, cards. both cards yeah like permanently and 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 to richard that was in, <laughs> to richard that was intrinsic to the game Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so lots of cards referred to the ante. Yes, um, yes. And he, he always liked doing those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and so what happened then was lots of people, sort of behind Richard's back, would say, oh, you want to play? Well, can we play for no ante? <laughs> behind Richard's back. Then you can play. Awesome. Yeah. Right, right, right. It was yeah. like pogs? I think Richard would prefer the analogy <laughs> to marbles. Yes. Marbles, okay. pogs, I, I think, yeah, or yeah. Or Richard would yeah. prefer the analogy to poker. Yeah. Okay, yeah. poker. Yeah. Well, so when but, but, I was a kid, we played Pogs, and it was the same mechanic for yeah. sure. You, right. you know, you put aside yeah. one, and right. you mm -hmm. flip the stack, and that's exactly that, that was it. And that's if you how if you lost your your brass bouncer, well, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's more marbles. <laughs> that, was, that, yeah. That's how <laughs> Magic was in the original, yeah. and this survived all the playtesting, and it was published this way when Magic was released in 1993. It was. Um, uh, Ante was the, the yeah. way you played. There was no, it wasn't an optional rule. I mean, mm -hmm. it quickly became the optional right. rule. Yeah, people I mean, house ruled yeah, it to people, optional real fast. Real fast, yeah. yeah That's the community, hardcore. The community immediately rejected it. <laughs> but yeah. I think that it was, we yeah. were used to yeah. having anti stuff in Arabian Nights too, right? 
Yeah. Oh, it passed that even, maybe. Yeah. I, I know there was Arabian Nights cards that had Yeah, no, it was past Arabian Nights. Yeah. But yeah, for sure it was in Arabian. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then for a while, kind of kind of out of deference to Richard, there was there was like one Annie card mm. per set. Mm -hmm. to sort of kind of keep it. Right. I, I forget. I don't honestly don't remember the last set that yeah, had it in yeah, it. Yeah. Might, maybe it was there one in Legends, maybe? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Who knows? Somebody will look that up online. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I want to talk about the first time we met. Okay. Because I don't know if you remember, but I remember really well. All right. Uh, well, but I'll, I'll describe <laughs> it to you. Now. I'll set it up. Uh -oh. so, so, okay, so the timeline is 1990, summer 91, Richard Events yep. Magic. Um, and it gets published in 1993, which is two years later. So what happens in between? So um, more well into that track in the um, fall of 1992, I'm pretty sure uh, when this was, um, we were close enough to really having to get serious about how the game was going to get published um, because we're like less than a year away. Um, we're not far from being having to send files to the printer and, and uh, for packaging and we're commissioning art and all this sort of stuff like that. And um, I sensed that there was a real, we really needed to have some synchronicity between what was happening in Philadelphia where the real brains of the game were mm -hmm. in terms of what the game was and mechanics and what you guys were doing and um, what was happening in Seattle which was more like, um, you know, on sales and marketing and having right. to do the art and, and graphics and, and editing. Production-y stuff. The production -y stuff, right? And so we need to have a meeting mind. So Lisa Stevens, who was our sales and marketing person, and um, Jesper Mirfors, who was uh, the art director for Magic the Gathering, and myself, we came out to the University of Pennsylvania and we met with you. And there is a picture, which I used to have, but I gave it to Richard. And it has mm -hmm. a picture of all of us in a classroom with a chalkboard. Uh -huh. And um, it's like you and, and Chris that, Page, all those guys. That but we, that's in 93. That's after the release. That no, 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 it was meeting. before the release. It was before the release. Because why would else would we have met in the University of Pennsylvania? Because Richard had moved away from Pennsylvania. Because it was, there was a convention in Philadelphia. Absolutely, no. there was a convention in Philadelphia. Oh, this is great. Have I got this wrong in my head all these years? Yeah, probably. Probably, yeah. yeah. Okay, at and, some point and, in and, time. And exactly. <laughs> yeah, at some point in yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, no, there, there was. And I, <laughs> I remember because um, you guys had taken product out there, which had sold out most everywhere, and you had these cardboard boxes of Alpha decks. Right. Sealed Alpha decks. Right. And, okay, uh, you're right. It was after release. Yeah, it was okay. after release. Okay. And then, and then uh, you didn't want to t t fly them back, so I bought them all. <laughs> I bought like <laughs> just crates of Alpha decks from you guys so that you didn't have to. Because nice. they were cheap. They were whatever. Which is, why you don't, or, which is why you don't have to work now if you don't want to. <laughs> no, I, I've got, unfortunately gotten rid of a lot of them. Yeah. Still have some. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay, you know, so yeah, this after. meeting happened. <laughs> this, is, this is why we have to have this conversation. That's right. But we actually met before that. Yeah, okay. Because I drove across country. I would drive every, in the summer, I would drive right. across the country and just, I don't know, visit right. random places. Right. Right. And so I, when I drove right. through, uh, uh, I would guess I was probably coming up from California, and I stopped and I met you in the summer of 92, so you're right about that. But okay. it was, I met you... Okay, oh, so like you took a parking lot or something yeah. like that. Yeah, <laughs> a parking lot. The secret, secret handoff of yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I believe that's right. I, I, yeah. I think Richard might have been there. I'm not right. sure about that. Right. All right. Yeah, yeah that's when we... Oh, that's, that's funny. Right. You know, this is a testament to... See, 10 years from now, we have no idea. Yes, we, right. This would be an impossible... Right. I think <laughs> I met you before. Yeah, I think we yeah. met. Um, yeah, and I think you took me to um, the Wizards of the Coast home office. Right. Uh, which summer in 92 your, would have been based in your my, home. It was my, based in your, your house, house. with so yeah. you know, the yeah. sliding door or whatever can, right. can come in from the right. bottom. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. And people were just stacked up. I mean, it was like, you know, the size mm -hmm. of this little sitting area, and there were yeah. desks and we papers. Had, and we had some... Play, we had some people who would work odd hours so that they could share a desk with somebody else who worked normal hours. Right. Yeah, yeah. We had 17 people in my basement by the time we moved out into a real office. Like hot bunking on a submarine. Or <laughs> <something> <laughs> <like that>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. So, um, so we met. <laughs> okay. We did meet, and um, eventually um, invited you to come out and work at uh, work in Seattle. Do you remember when you came out to Seattle? I do. It was the summer of 94. Right. I remember, um, so we had, uh, we were really worried about 
coming out to work there, you know, because we had a <laughs> career path. Right. <laughs> and this didn't seem like it would be that. So it was going to be a one year, right? So you gave us a one year contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we, um, I, I can remember, you know, asking Penn for, can we take a year leave of absence? They said, sure, no problem. And then, you know, the next year, one year later, you know, they said, oh, you're coming back. I'm like, oh, can we have another one year leave of absence? And they said, sure, no problem. Mm -hmm. And then the third year, you uh -huh. know, so this would have been 96, like, hey, can we have another one year leave of absence? And they were like, uh, sure, but then you'll have to reapply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take as long as you want. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so. Yeah, which, uh, but you stayed out through all, all those. We stayed out. We, we stayed through. Uh, several people went back, actually, you know, of the three. Of the th f mm -hmm. of the four people you offered a contract to, one said no, I'm not coming. That right. was Chris Page. Chris Page, mm -hmm. right? And then Dave Petty, Dave Petty went back after back. one year. He mm -hmm. was yep. one year, and then he actually went back and got his PhD. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then Jim and I stayed. Yep. So, mm -hmm. so you were 50 50. Right. That's how good working for the Wizards Coast was. <laughs> eh, 50 50. Whether you stay or go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So we know we packed up. We had a huge caravan. We packed up everything into big moving vans, and we rolled out. And we showed up in the summer of '94. Yeah. So, um, uh, what was your first impression of uh, working at Wizard of the Coast? My first impression of Wizard of the Coast. So we have this gigantic, uh, the biggest whatever U-Haul you can get without a some kind of special license, right? So it's like a thirty foot long, you know, big tall thing. It's parked right out mm -hmm. back, and uh, and we work, and then we come out. We're gonna. I'm gonna hop in the 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 van to move it to where we are, where we're gonna stay. And uh, and then then I hear this, whoa, whoa, don't start it, don't start it, don't start it. I'm like, what's going on? I'm look around, don't start it. And then people come out from under the <laughs> van. Under the van. <laughs> under the van or they're maybe down behind the, the bottom part. And that's because there was no shade, <coughs> right? There was sun, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? It's like, oh no, we're, you know, we're just using your shade. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's because it wasn't that hot. And they're like, it's the look, man, because they were vampire people, right? <laughs> so they were they had really white skin that they didn't want the sun to touch. So they were smoking out back, but they, there was no shade. So you had to like crouch into the shadow of the van lest they get a tan. So that's yeah. kind of a that that's was my first. That's pretty much the same story was, that Jim told. Me. Yeah. Oh, pretty, really? Pretty consistent. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah I yeah, was like, good. whoa. Yeah, it was a little. Yeah, yeah, we were really testing Jim there to see if the oh, story okay. was accurate. Okay, yeah, yeah, you came up with a good, the same, st oh, the same story. Yeah, yeah, we did have a lot of goths working for the company. Yeah, at the were, time. yeah. And, it, and in fact, we're going to have one of them on our show in a couple of weeks. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe she was the one I almost ran over with the van. I hope. <laughs> well, fortunately, you didn't. Yes. <laughs> no. So that I think that was my that was pretty much my uh, first impression. Although by the time I had come out, I had visited you three or four times right. since then. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because for Legends, you know, right. I'd come out. And right. I come out one other time. I flew out several times. So, mm -hmm. Well, on the time I came out to the East Coast, and we met for the second time, <clears throat> um, <laughs> I guess the first time didn't really didn't leave that much of an impression. But the second time left an impression. Well, But I do remember, because we, we had this big yeah. dinner. Yeah. I think it was just pizza in yeah, a, yeah. In a conference room. Or a, the, yep. What do they even call them? Conference rooms in a school. A lecture hall. Class mm -hmm. room, classroom lecture hall. And... Um, uh, what I remember was we all sat down to eat, and you grabbed a chair and came. I was sitting at the end of the table, so there's somebody sitting here and somebody sitting here. You you grabbed a chair and you came up and sat on the corner, so kind of like basically kind of like squeezed in. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, Sorry. To, to, no, no, to me. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody else was just talking, social talking, and, yeah. and you were like, Peter, we got things we got to talk about. We do. We did. <laughs> we, we, we were like, <laughs> so we were wasting time. <laughs> we're wasting time. We got, yeah. we got big issues to discuss. Yeah, and, and I think what we were really diving into was the structure of expansions. Absolutely. Yeah, cause, and that also fits your version of, of events of this meeting having taking place in 93. Right. As opposed to my version of it right. taking place in 1992. Right. Uh, so Magic was already out, and... We would have then uh, been contemplating sending uh, about or very close to sending files to Carter Monday for printing Arabian Nights. Then. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember us having a, a lot of discussion about how expansions sh should be mm -hmm. structured. Um, you know, there was the issue of, of different card backs, right? Which I think is kind of well documented now in, in Magic lore. Finally. But there is also sort of the question of whether all the expansions that came after Magic, all the expansions of Magic, 
should just be adding more and more cards to basically a big collection of cards that you could play right. versus um, another uh, um, view, which was that at some point we stop publishing magic and we come out with a new version of magic which has new cards and that version of magic would not be played with the old version of magic. Right. You remember this? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like it was yesterday. Good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what, what was, was the, what was the what was the different rationales and why did Oh, the why correct did, rationale was yeah. to have the same card back so people could mix cards if they wanted to. <laughs> right. I mean, in terms of yeah. uh, The other rationale was don't do that so people can't do that. Now, I will defend Richard's point of view. Richard was different card backs. That right, was his right, big thing. Right, mm -hmm. Um right. Because, because he's kind of, he's smarter than basically everybody else, and he's also kind of goofy. And he would play deck games where the card backs would be different, and that was to him a feature, right? right. Like, mm -hmm. that's just fine. And you like, memorize you might this, know you memorize that. This yeah. next card is going to yeah. be. And then uh, you, you better know that and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's very difficult for other people, and it's extremely easy for people to say, don't mix those together. They have different backs. Mm -hmm. And. From my perspective, we didn't want that because we wanted to sell expansions so mm -hmm. that you you know you kept getting hooked and it kept refreshing mm -hmm. your your thing. And I, I did not think it would be easy for people to uh, it would be a, an easy decision point for people to not mix those. Whereas right. if they have the same back, it's uh, it's impossible, right? Someone just shows up with the deck. If they really really want to, they can you can go through and see on the face the expansion symbol. And so m remove it if you need to. Mm -hmm. But the default then would be, instead of talking about it, the default would be to just play with the cards mm -hmm. mixed. So I kind of thought that was pretty important. Yeah. Uh, nobody else did. Well, and we, <laughs> were, and, and we all love Richard Garfield. He's, and, of course, we wouldn't be here without him. Yeah, uh, so we're not trying sure. to really rain on his, uh, you know, his, his vision of that. Yeah. But uh, was there more to he it? Still than, did, he's still not convinced it was right that, that's the truth <laughs> yeah okay because okay. well, he thinks people might have just played with them all mixed anyway and so. that, yeah and they might have but I mean. do you think there was um uh but putting the card back if we can if there's more to say about this question that more than just the card backs the idea do you think there was some merit to this idea of stopping magic as it was first printing coming out with a new like ice age i think right. i think you designed you were a designer yeah, on one ice the, age you were one of the designers were, yeah. on ice age and ice age was sort of the most um i don't know if most important is the right word to say it was kind of like the sort of the biggest deal on horizon arabian nights and antiquities were kind right. of like let's throw smaller some more sets, let's yeah. let's put in some smaller sets right. to feed the market get things going um but we as a company and i think especially r d was really thinking about ice age as this is the, this is the the next most important thing right. we're going to do mm -hmm. in magic, and is there more merit to this idea um, that that we lost? Well, I don't think we lost it because for a long time we had people playing it separately, and in fact, the standard environment as it is now, I think they call it standard. Who knows? Take two. <laughs> uh, that that environment essentially is was our vision for you take a, a standalone block and you play it, or two standalone blocks and you play it, and that rolls throughout time. Mm -hmm. right. So we wanted extra cards to keep things interesting, but I mean, everyone knew if you have an infinite set of cards, there's just going to be problems with it, right. um, and, and really massive problems with it, um, which of course were exacerbated because the the low print numbers in the beginning. So you know that right. sort of. But even once you get past that, even if if you could have any cards you wanted, the environment just gets too big after a certain point. And it puts a lot of pressure on people monetarily, but right. also just on the designers. You just can't design to have you know ten thousand cards all in all in play at once. Um, and you, the other thing is, it's bad for the players too because you can keep refreshing things. So like, right. uh, but just by changing the mix, so now it's a whole different play experience. Right. So yeah, I think there is merit to it, but I think it. You, you, it you was, don't feel like it was we, done. We didn't miss I, any opportunity. You, you don't feel like we missed. I mean, I, I was kind of reaching for, you know, um, I, I think we all generally agree, except maybe Richard, that where we landed was a really good thing. I was just trying to explore whether there's something we missed. But it sounds like there yeah. wasn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And it was also like the first uh, couple times you lied to me was about that card back thing. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. The first couple times that you know of. That I know uh -huh. of. That's right. Right, right. First, okay, tell, tell me about the times I lied. Well, and the, I didn't catch him in this lie till last year. 
Yeah. Edge okay. Uh oh. Yeah. Hmm? So, to the two lies were uh, that, that we met in '92. <laughs> Shots no. fired over here. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that uh, that uh, so after pulling the chair up, I mean, I talked with Peter. We had this big argument. Everyone was arguing back and forth, and 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 Peter was convinced. He said, "You know what? We're going to go with the same card backs." Mm -hmm. And he goes off, and he's like, "You convinced me." That's lie mm -hmm. number one, because then immediately he changed the decision. Because I, I, I guess they were going to have the same card backs. Uh, well, but I in that meeting, it was like, I was so happy, like it was done. It was like, I thought like, this is going to be awesome. And, uh, and then he had changed the decision. Then he gets back home and this is Carol told this story, I guess. Mm -hmm. And she said, then the distributors and retailers said, we heard, or you maybe asked their right. opinion mm -hmm. or something. We heard changing card backs. And they're like, that's the stupidest thing we ever heard. Carol Making being Carol Monahan. Carol Monahan, who will be our, who will be on the show in a few weeks, yeah. four weeks from now. Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll be so sure. Thank goodness. <laughs> the, for the, the people in the real world, the, you know, the retailers and distributors, because they were very clear, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the distributors and retailers so, were so very logic clear. So logic didn't convince you, but money did. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's fair. That's, I mean, I walk a delicate yeah. line. I'm, so then, you know, so then not only did you tell me that you were going to change it and then you weren't, but then you told me you, for years, you told me that I was the person that convinced you. I didn't even know that I wasn't. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember any of this. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't. I do not recall. All right. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, Judge. I do not recall. I like to think that it was uh, both parts were necessary. Right. I, like I mean, if, I could speculate. I could have. If everyone I mean, on your whole design the, staff was very consistent that the, the card back should right. be different, you probably wouldn't have listened to the. Mm -hmm. Well, the I think the you know uh, I can imagine you talking me into the importance of of the same card back. And then Richard talking me. Yeah, out of it. I mean, because of course Richard is, um, is smarter than all of us yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, yeah. And then, uh, but yeah, of course I'm going to listen to the retailers and <laughs> because well, it, you know that's where the money. It was getting to be pretty last minute at that point. Yes, you know. yes. Lisa Stevens told a great story of the mm -hmm. of faxing a shimitar as a to card a Monday. Oh, for uh, the symbol. For, for the yeah. for the symbol, uh, there, there was some there was some fun fun chaos around uh, yeah. trying to make that change in the card back. Literally, uh, like within hours of wow. of card Monday going to press. Yeah, yeah. So that was definitely a decision that came right up to the wire. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, how do you feel? We kind of explored that topic, but I'm, on a, I'm wondering if there's any other sort of um, kind of, I guess what I'm getting at is like, you looking back on all those decisions, and we, that's just one. I mean, there are other types of decisions. Oh like, my gosh, yeah. It, it, like, like anything where you feel like we really screwed up. Like, oh, we got that wrong. Or... Or, 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 if, oh or God, we, did, we almost got or we that almost, wrong. Yeah, yeah, close call. Um, oh, there's so many things we almost got wrong. Um, I mean, just, yeah, copious amounts of things we almost got wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, th I think we got pretty lucky. I mean, I think the, um, I didn't like how many expansions there were early on. I thought there, I thought yeah. it was too many for a more general population to keep up yeah. with. Yeah. And I didn't like how few of the stuff that was being printed, right? Cause it, right. Because we were still trying for it to be a collectible. Mm -hmm. right. So it was like, oh, well, you're going to order the cards, and we'll print the cards, and then even if the orders rise, we'll just allocate the stuff. And um, that way it retains its value because you know just like a baseball card set. Mm -hmm. that, and I think that that was like it. I don't know, it really bugged me going into stores and seeing it marked up above retail price. I know that made a lot of people happy, but I was one of those – people that couldn't always afford all the, you know, like the stuff you're getting in a gaming store. And so that kind of rubbed me the wrong way of like the people that were making money off it. And the, that difference in price was just, um, I don't know, just preventing, you know, whatever little kids from playing it, that kind of thing. So, well, yeah, I mean, I remember Legends Boosters going for like 10 bucks mm -hmm. uh, at retail the, the, the yeah. day it launched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it was like the difference between, so these people who, you know, I was one of them that would go to the hobby stores or we all were the people that were there in the hobby stores right away with a relationship with the retailer. Mm -hmm. So because we were, I don't know, nerds or whatever, losers, whatever the word is. And then so we could get the cards, right? But then the next wave, the next wave out couldn't. 
Just to be clear, SCAP did not imply that all geeks are losers, just nerds. I didn't imply, I said it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so anyway, but I was one of them. And so, like, that's cool. But then it's like, how are you going to get it beyond, you know, beyond that? So, but then eventually we, you know, we opened up the printing presses and then that was fine. Uh, so that was one thing. Part of that was about capacity, though, too. Well, not... No. Well, yes, yes. A lot of it was capacity. I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, certainly around legends. I mean, Card of Monday was trying to ramp up its ability. Sure, to print, but like by uh, the dark or whatever. Yeah. You know, we mm -hmm. we printed less of that than we could have. Right. Um, probably probably printed less legends than we could have as well. Maybe not Arabian Nights or you know, or antiquities, but. I, I, I won't press a point because I know that my memory is so faulty, but I, I yeah. do know that uh, it was certainly a regular conversation with Carta Monday, like what sure. their capacity was. Yes. Um, yeah. And that was certainly one factor as we were trying to, to set print yeah. runs. Yeah, certainly not for original magic or Arabian yeah. Nights and probably not antiquities, but by the time we're getting into the realm of the legends in the dark, which are the sort of the two expansions that kind of fall in, you know, big print runs, but not right. disastrously print runs, right. big print runs like right. Fallen Empires was, right? Right. So that those so two, it's like at what those, point are you allocated and what per point yeah. were you not? Well, th they became allocated in pretty much every case. I think, I mean, you know, it would be fun sure. to ask Carol that when she gets, she's on the show because she was a um, sales manager during yeah. this time. But um, we were consistently dealing with um, allocation problems and then, you know, people would up their orders for the next right. set. And then by the time we were ready to ship them the set, they were uh they had increased their order sure again. so the key so the and key thing is well i mean it's even more simple than that eventually they just started going back on press so like you, you know we always could have done that yeah can you guys expand a little bit on what you mean by allocation okay so um uh yeah as we were printing magic cards uh in the first few sets um there's a delay between the decision of how many cards should we print and um, in making that decision and the cards actually shipping, right? And so it's a, it was about two to three months um, because we were printing in Belgium. So there was also mm -hmm. having to ship over mm -hmm. uh, across the ocean back to the United States. Although we did, res we did resort to air lift on a number of occasions. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have these orders from distributors for let's say 10 million cards, which is when the, what they would order mm -hmm. at the point in time when we had to order the cards. Mm -hmm. Then by the time we're shipping the cards, they would have increased their orders. And so maybe by the time we shipped the cards, we had orders for 50 million cards, mm -hmm. but we'd only printed the 10. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you'd go to each distributor and say, we're just gonna, we, we don't, right. we're just gonna ship you a fifth of your order because that's 10 over 50. Yeah. Um, and the, um, uh, and this was the, the thing that we were chasing every through time. 1994. Yep. Um, and every print run of Arabian Nights was like 5 million cards. I think Antiquities was like 15 million cards. And Legends was like 35 million cards. I think The Dark was like 60 million cards. Yeah. And each time we're trying to catch demand. But we're also worried about the financial exposure. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're not idiots we know yeah. that 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 this thing could be a fad to some extent we don't sure. know to what extent this is a fad. Well, we know we actually more than that we know it's gonna it's we it's know we pop. we know at some point we're going to overprint like right. there's no question right at some so, point yeah, we're going to print point. too many cards yeah. and we have distributors really upset at us because we're not they believe we're shorting the market on purpose and um so this this led to this currently chasing and and this whole thing about allocation was happening at their level too sure uh, so, so you had distributors yep. why do they want to order so many cards because they're getting orders from retailers yep. that they keep going up and up to the right, right. Mm -hmm. and the retailers are getting orders from consumers mm -hmm. you know so what happened you know we were under a lot of prejudice is all a nice prelude to the whole fallen empire mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. is that we promised that okay the next expansion we will print as much as you order and if you order by this date so get You'll us get, your, it. get get us your orders in mm -hmm. and i mean it was so mind-boggling more than it was a we, big jump it, it was, was a huge it jump was, it was 300 and some million cards yeah so whatever yeah, factor wow. of five yeah. or five, six over yeah. the wow. dark yeah. and so 
we were definitely worried, but we felt that we had promised this to the re to the distributors. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that a phenomenon known as phantom buying. You had distributors who are used, we had trained them that mm -hmm. their order would be allocated, that they wouldn't get as many as they ordered. So you had distributors uh, artificially order. inflating their order, right. figuring that we were going to uh, mm -hmm. reduce it. Cut it. Yeah. Even though well, we promised that we wouldn't. Even though we promised we wouldn't. And then you had retailers doing the same thing. What retailers were doing is because they were so upset about getting allocated, oh, no. we had trained retailers to order from multiple distributors. So you had retailer who maybe has a demand for 100 cases of cards, orders 200 cases from three different distributors. And the next level, the consumers were doing it. Mm -hmm. You had gamers who we trained to not rely on any single retailer. So the gamers who were really adamant about getting their cards were pre-ordering Magic cards from multiple retailers. Yep. Yep. And so this this this, big this, shock. Yep. Exp this exponential factor on the demand is applying at all three levels of the distribution tier and it's known as phantom buying and that's what led to the Fallen Empires yep. collapse. Uh, yep. And um, so for those who don't know what happened with Fallen Empires, what happened? Well, it was overprinted. So it was way overprinted, it sounds like, like way. It actually, Fallen Empires wasn't way overprinted. Okay. <laughs> because uh, you can talk, like the distributors later, right, were buying it up. It, it actually got, Homelands was the only set that never got above our sale price on the secondary market. But it was well, way overprinted. It was, it, it was overprinted, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then so. Well, and, I, and to explain yeah. that really, it was overprinted when you add an additional factor to all this, which is that a lot of people. We were also overprinting fourth edition at the same well, time. Okay, but yeah. also speculation. So yeah. part of the demand from at all three tiers of this, mm -hmm. from the consumer who's ordering from multiple stores, from the stores who are ordering from multiple distributors, it's not all people that are buying the cards because they want to build decks out of them. Right. A lot of the people are buying these cards because it's a collectible, and in, in the prior examples, in the prior expansions of Magic, people will buy cards and at some price and turn it around and resell mm -hmm. the cards to somebody else right. at a higher price and make instant right. profit. Yeah. So this speculation. So what happened is when it was clear that we had printed demand with Fallen Empires, and that people were not going to be mm -hmm. able to resell the pri product, the, mm -hmm. the cards, for a profit, at least not immediately. Right. Mm -hmm. Ever again. Then, then the demand <laughs> dropped yes. significantly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. since some of that demand was speculation, was fake, all fake. that demand disappeared yep. uh, suddenly. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, great. And yes. And we were yeah, we were happy. Uh, On some <laughs> level. Happy. And so well, we eventually became unequivocally happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were nervous though, because it was mm -hmm. definitely a huge bubble popping. We didn't sure. know how far it was gonna fall on the other side. Right. So there were r no, no, legitimate no. We, yep. business there terrors. Were. Well, yeah, because <laughs> and, and up until that point, we didn't know how what percentage of the market was speculators and collectors. Yeah, and you, yeah you really, that's players. right, absolutely true. Right, right. Yep. Did not have any idea. Mm -hmm. And then there becomes a psychological concern of like, was Magic dead and blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, stuff like that. It's such a good game. Don't so, worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> no. I know. Yeah. That's exactly what yeah. we told ourselves. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure what you told me. Probably. Probably. Probably what I told you. Yeah. But anyway, so, yeah, that, that, was, that was a possible mistake. I think, and, you know, even, even later, I don't know if you remember this, but even in alliances, mm -hmm. people, because of homelands, I think, people were... Um, people were worried about overprinting. And then so Alliances was gonna be underprinted. Mm -hmm. So you remember we offered to print the cards for you, <laughs> right? People in the research and development department went, we had a deal that we were gonna sign with Wizards of the Coast and say, we will take 100% of the downside risk of this product. We will pay your print costs and you were gonna pay us back. <laughs> Do you remember this? No, I don't remember this. Okay, this, we went to Jim Stanton. <laughs> I know I would have immediately dismissed it. Well, we went to Jim Stanton, and the thing is, we sat there, we argued, it was, and then probably John Jordan too, and right. uh, we we said, look, you, you cannot lose. They said, like, we don't want to blah, blah, blah. There was no way to lose. Right. And uh, and then they, they upped the print numbers, because they knew that we were, if we were willing to put our own money I, to cover the that, downside risk. That sounds like what my reaction would have been. Mm-hmm. Well, great. Right. That's all we wanted. We right. said up the sure. print numbers. You said no. Yeah. We said, well, how about if we pay you to? Right. And then you were like, and so okay, you got what well, you wanted. It didn't actually have to put your money on the line. So right. yeah. Well, so it sounds like your R and D people were really invested, Peter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's great, Scott. That's a good story. Incredibly invested. Um, and I, I think also, you know, one of the things that um, I like to say about you, which is that 
You always thought Please, about is this the, your third. No, lie? this is a good. Oh, this, so is, <laughs> this is my third lie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, you, um, I, we became very close because you always thought about the whole business um, more so. Um, well, I imagine, I mean, and more, I mean, and very intelligently thought about the whole business. I mean, you always, you always consistently put yourself in, in my shoes and the types of decisions that I was making. And, and, and you also, and that would have been useless, except you also had the bravado to charge into my office and tell me. Um, I went to your office a lot. You went to my office a lot. <laughs> well, and I think that's part of why, you know, some of us who were kind of in other departments were glad to see you working on brand management. Okay. I didn't know that anyone was glad to see me working on brand management. <laughs> Is, this, oh, okay. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah. one of the things that, that at least in my little corner of the world we uh -huh. were afraid of was that somebody was going to be running it who was more, who was only concerned with sort of how you would do a product right as opposed to how you would do this product and you cared about both in a way that I don't know that that many other people did I I mean I lived and breathed it for you know mm -hmm. many years uh, so I really well I I have often said that I um, I got to the point where I did not contemplate any strategic decisions for the company on any product line without talking to you about it mm -hmm. I mean you might probably think of some example where I should have and it didn't but slay industry <laughs> no that was too early oh, okay that was too early that was before mm -hmm. you had earned that level of trust oh. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah but, well th that's that's a great segue actually that was really nice for you guys to share that Scaff what do you think what do you think the lasting mark you had on magic was what was your biggest contribute contribution well, to magic. actually, it might have been the card packs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's such a minor thing now. I think the thing that gets mostly said is the um, the Pro Tour. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, th that's, that was near and dear to me for a long time, uh, making it kind of socially acceptable outside of the, you know, the small circle of the hobby gaming industry and uh, really trying to give back to the players and make it competitive. Um, and, that, and that was really... I've worked at a lot of companies since then, and sort of the amount of um, control or power or whatever that I had there at Wizards was very special. Like, that enabled us, me, whatever, to, mm -hmm. uh, to do things that I, yeah. I just, it's just not done. Because there was, anytime you try to get something done like that, there's just so many barriers, because no one's mm -hmm. done it before, or... We don't want to mm -hmm. do this or give money out to people and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, so it'd be the pro tour probably. I, I think I would agree. So, uh, so um, a lot of us have come into magic as a hobby post pro tour, right? So what did it look like just before the pro tour? And like, what was your vision well, for that? So no, I mean, if you're a kid today, you can't even understand this, but there was no such thing, n no such thing as professional gaming. Like it just, I mean, outside of, you know, gambling or whatever, I, I mean, it wasn't, no one put money on tournaments or if they did they put it it was like a you know oh here's a whatever five hundred dollars for the world championship for whatever and get a tour of our offices or you know that kind of thing and maybe it, and you would make what you cost to go to the yeah, thing yeah right and 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 that included computer games the computer mm -hmm. games weren't putting any no one was doing mm -hmm. that and and so that was and i sort of came from like my family's not really a gaming family and didn't really support that and so it's like well, how do you make, and I really fundamentally believe this, like where the game is so good that you can devote your life to it. Like it can mm -hmm. be your sport and your hobby. And so how do you reward the player for making it their sport uh, mm -hmm. or their hobby? And, um, and, and how do you make it socially acceptable for people? And you know, the answer, since we live in America, mm -hmm. and uh, we won the war against communism, is to put money on it. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it really, like, you know, you would hear stories about people, like, there, there would be people on the football team that played Magic. This is like my friend Worth. He's like, right. oh, he played yeah. Magic. And it's like, oh, that's kind of nerdy. And he's like, yeah, well, he just, he comes back from the weekend having won, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. 750 bucks at the Pro Tour qualifier. And now mm -hmm. he's qualified, and it's like, wait, you just won and then immediately that sort of silences people or you know someone that 
could take it seriously enough that it could be their profession. And so it added this, and then of course now everybody copies it, even sometimes they shouldn't, but like computer games, mm -hmm. just the whole, everything is. Esports. Is, is, esports mm -hmm. is just, well it's not just esports, gaming sports is just now, it's taken for granted. And yeah. in, inside the company, there were maybe three people that thought it was a good idea. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it was, it was super negative reaction, right? Inside the company. Uh, like, I, I think, uh, I look back at the moment, and by the way, this is in the wake of Fallen Empires. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's sort of the aftermath of Fallen Empires of having um, ha having a, the, sort of the most serious crisis I think that Magic has faced since it was published was probably Fallen Empires and and uh, the, you know, uh, whatever sort of market correction there was after that. And, and the response of, um, of repositioning Magic as an intellectual sport Rolling out the whole Pro Tour program, uh, the Grand, you know, the Grand Prix, yeah. the World Championship, the Pro Tour events, the, the DCI organization for rankings and ratings of players, um, all of this, we put together in like about two months. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was this period in that winter, if I, if my memory is right, it's. I mean, there was a lot more time to implement everything like that. But I mean, the strategy. Oh, the strategy you, was pretty quick. Yeah, you spearheaded mm -hmm. this strategy. Yeah, the strategy and, came about. It was about a and, year yeah. uh, of, and, of work, right? You know, but yeah, the strategy came together came pretty together pretty quickly, really quick. And um, and there was a very short list of people. Yeah. Now, I'm sure there were people, you know, in the trenches who who may have been, you know, sort of silently in, in favor of it. But everybody I was dealing with in executive management. Um, was against it, except for, um, you know, Rick Ahrens and yeah. you. And, and well, Rick Ahrens was not, remember, Rick Ahrens was not an executive man. Right, 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 right. No, he wasn't. He was but the I mean, dude running the duelist. I know, he was, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, literally. But yeah, it was yeah, definitely yeah. A, a point in time where we had to go against what the, sort of the prevailing right. um, mm -hmm. intelligentsia was saying, was like, no, yeah. we shouldn't do that. Um, so, Scaff, you came from a family that was like, Football, I'm assuming, you know, more sports Yeah, one of my cousins is a professional football player. Yeah, and my so dad played for a nationally ranked college team. And mm -hmm. my brother-in-law was a professional golfer. It's like and the whole family is just, except so for you, me, except for me. <laughs> but you had all this sports influence, and you're like, why can't we do what these folks do for their individual sports for my sport? Yeah. Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, and pretty then, much. Yeah, just right. make it and respectable. And then so you're like, you march into Peter's office, and you're like, check this out. I've got the best idea. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And then, but it was a hard, it was hard convincing the rest well, of the. Well, it's kind of like right? a skunk works thing. We weren't allowed to do it through any of the normal channels, right? It was totally well, separate. It I was had separate to from up. our organized play. <clears throat> we, it was separate from yeah. our marketing. It was separate from everything. Well, what we had to do. I remember talking to Vince about this. This I do remember. It's not a lie. I remember Vince was my mentor, and he was on the board, you know, yeah. and, and and of course it never would have happened if Richard hadn't been there no, no, supporting it too. Obviously, but Richard was always kind of quiet. He was, a, you know, he was a thinker mm -hmm. more than a proselytizer, right? Um, and I remember talking to Vince, and like, I think we got to go this direction, but I really don't think I have the management team in place that's really going to support this. And um, and Vince is one that told me he says, well, you, you form a new division, you form a new a new department, you find mm -hmm. somebody who can lead this. Um, who uh, who believes in this? Somebody will be their big chance to do something, and you just form another organization. Have that person work directly for you, and let them hire who they need to hire, uh, and and they'll get it done. And so we we promoted Rick Aaron's to run it, yeah. and he put the. I remember he put together this PowerPoint pitch describing the the organized play strategy. He called it. The, it was a sports analogy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talked about making players into superstars, mm -hmm. having the. The, the duelist is a way to talk about the, the mm -hmm. players. Yeah. New magazine having, we launched the, the, the Pro Tour the yeah. Pro Tour magazine. Yeah. yeah, the Pro Tour magazine. Mm -hmm. Having having it trying to get it on ESPN. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, got, not trying, we got it. Got it. Yeah. 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 But but at the time he was talking about yeah, it, he's yeah, yeah, like, yeah, this yeah, is what right. we want to do. Right, right. Um, mm -hmm. him uh, you know, and the and and the purse. You know, yeah. We put a million dollar pro tour. Yeah. I mean that was that was the that was the catchphrase for a long time. And um you know I I love talking about that era because to me it felt like um, uh, I'm mean, not to brag for myself a bit, <laughs> but I, I felt like it was the the smartest thing I did was supporting it. Right? Like I feel like well, Richard gave yeah. us magic. Um, 
we got Pokemon because Ishihara came in and said, hey, sure. would you like to do this? We, right. Yeah. I mean, respect for everything, right? Exactly, the, right. The Pro Tour, but mainly Magic and, yeah. All we that. got Dungeons yeah. & Dragons because well, the other management, you and know. And the, the Pro Tour really was its own product. It was yeah. like, yeah. A, you know, I mean, it, it used Magic, but it, I mean, you had your own dedicated editor who did nothing <laughs> but, but that Tours. because you guys were generating that much material. Yeah. 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 Much easier editing job than the cards, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it was a, it was it was when you when you were trying to do all the these are the these are the new DCI tournament rules for this and then you wouldn't make up your mind about something until the last five seconds then that part was hard. Yeah, but. okay, that's <laughs> that maybe true, but it could be wrong, right? The cards couldn't be wrong, so right? It could be a little could be a little bit wrong. <laughs> they can be a little bit wrong. It's fine. Right, it's but fine. it's not fine for the cards to be a little bit wrong. Right? That's, yeah. That was a, card editing is a really hard job, and again, that's another thing is like I appreciate so much the, I don't know the power control right that that I, I was given on the the Magic brand and the mm -hmm. and the Pro Tour, but like, yeah, getting people to edit cards outside of Wizards mm -hmm. is kind of mm -hmm. hard. I mean, I think they're sort of finally catching up, but if you get an editor that hasn't edited specifically mm -hmm. tra trading cards before, it's a disaster. Oh, yeah, it's a yeah, but that's a, the training on editing Pro Tour stuff is a really great way to work your way up. To oh, okay. Kristen, you got any questions from? Uh, uh, I have God. already asked them. Oh, oh that's okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thought about Kristen, you got brilliant questions. Oh, no, you've got brilliant audience. Yes, you think? Well, <laughs> most of my questions were me. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I had one from the audience, so thanks for that, Peter. <laughs> yes, thank you, Kristen. <laughs> So, hey, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so what, what have you been doing, I mean, you, you know, lately? What, 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 what's your life now post-Wizards? I mean, we've spent a lot of time talking about the 90s, but what do you do these days? Well, uh, what do I do these days? R Richard and I, well, I have a company with Richard Garfield, uh, Three Donkeys, uh, and um, we basically consult on game design stuff. We have always mm -hmm. have 10 projects going at once. And so we have 10 projects going at once. Now the games that we've done recently that are out in the marketplace are Keyforge. Yep, that's uh, got a lot of attention. Yeah, and Keyforge, boy, I could talk forever about <laughs> Keyforge, uh, the whole way I would like to see that organized play go. But, because um, uh, it's really, it's a, it's a completely unique thing. It's as, as, as unique as trading card games were in the industry and then. Mm -hmm. It's people kind of think of it as a trading card game. It's, it's actually, it's a big step forward. It's one of Richard's passions. Um, and Artifact, the mm -hmm. computer game, that launch didn't go so well, although Richard and I still love the game. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, r really love the game. Uh, and um, and uh, there's new King of Tokyo stuff coming out yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you should mention your book. Okay, yeah, one thing that Richard and Robert and I are pretty proud of is we Robert, Robert Gutierrez, who okay, worked yeah, with Wizards okay, for a long Rob, time. Yep. The three of us wrote a book based on a course that Richard and I did at uh, University of Washington. And, um, and it's called Characteristics of Games. Hmm. Uh, Elias Garfield Gutierrez. Excellent. So, and mm -hmm. that, yeah, we're, we're kind of proud of that. So Great. Pick it up. Fabulous. There you go. You heard it there. Okay, then. All right. Well, um, that brings us to uh, to the end of today's session. Um, thank you, Scott. Oh, yeah, thanks for, for being, being yeah. on the show. Mm -hmm. um, I think we could have talked another hour easy. Uh, At least we'll we can probably do it this have to, every week for yeah. ever. We could yeah. <laughs> probably have to. Uh, see we didn't you even again. talk about any embarrassing stories. I know. I know. Yeah. Okay. So that there we go. That, uh, we'll we'll have purpose. to come back to that. Yes. Um, uh, so, and thank you for joining us today on uh, Fireside with Peter Atkinson. Uh, thanks also to my co-host, Beverly Marshall Sailing, uh, to my producer, Kristen Jensen, the disembodied uh, voice that was uh, funneling our questions from the audience and coming up with brilliant questions of her own. And um, also uh, thanks to the Chaldea Studio, where we are streaming from on a regular basis here on Gen Con TV. And thank you to Gen Con TV for being a host of our show. Um, we are going to take a couple of weeks off. Um, I don't remember why I'm missing next week. The week, <laughs> the weekend after that, I'm going to Origins. Mm -hmm. I think maybe next week you had a conflict. Wedding, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have a couple of conflicts. Well, we will be back on June 19th with Rias Hall, who may have been one of the people taking shelter under the back of the van when you moved to. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to ask. Uh, yes, yes, we will, we will have to ask. Uh, so uh, until then, I know you're going to miss us terribly, but um, 
do come and check out Gen Con TV on Fridays at 11 a.m. for Table, ta table Takes, which is our weekly uh, recap of what's happening in the world of tabletop games. And also on um, Mondays at, right, 5 p.m., I can't read my own writing sometimes. Uh, Mondays at 5 p.m. This is all Pacific time for the Brothers Murph. All right. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you later. <laughs> Yay.